Let's give a warm welcome to Seth Stevens Davidowitz. Uh, well, thank you everybody for attending this talk. It's a big honor to be here. Uh, a lot of my friends would probably laugh at the idea of me being a sex expert, but... Uh, and this talk is about what we can learn about human sexuality, about what people really want and really desire from new internet data sources. So the problem with learning about sex, traditionally, is that people lie to surveys. So if you ask people questions about their maybe more embarrassing or uncomfortable topics, people are gonna try to make themselves look good. They're gonna lie and move in the direction of the socially acceptable answer. So to start, let's just ask, how frequently do people have sex? Kind of a basic question about human sexuality. How often do people actually have sex? And if you ask surveys, you get some different answers. So if you ask heterosexual men, how frequently do you have sex? heterosexual sexual encounters, they say they have sex two to three times a week, and they use condoms 20% of the time. And this adds up to 1.6 billion condoms every year in the United States in heterosexual sex, according to men. If you ask women the exact same questions, do the exact same math, they say they use 1.1 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. And as you can see, these numbers should be equal, right? If everyone's telling the truth, heterosexual men and heterosexual women should be using the same amount of condoms in sex, but they're not. So somebody isn't telling the truth. Who is telling the truth, men or women? Neither. It turns out only 600 million condoms are sold every year in the United States, according to Nielsen. Uh, so basically, everybody now is lying about how much sex they're having. It's just men are lying a little bit more than, than women are lying. Uh, and I think this kind of shows my basic point, which motivates my research, which is, is that you can't really trust surveys on these topics. People are going to feel pressure to uh, give a socially acceptable answer. And people are honest on Google. Uh, you might think from your own experience, there may be things you've typed to Google that you might not have told a friend, a lover, a partner, a doctor, a psychiatrist even. People tell everything to Google, uh, even things they're embarrassed to tell other people. And you can see this in the data. So another one is if you ask people, do you watch porn, only about 25% of people in the United States say they watch porn. Uh, it turns out on Google, porn is more Googled than weather. So, uh, and I mean, I assume like 100% of people probably check the weather, so. Uh, that probably is hard to reconcile with only 25% of people actually watching porn. So people are typing things about their health, their s sex lives, their in anything they're willing to, to type in Google. And right away, we see a very different picture of human sexuality. We don't see this two to three times a week. Uh, everybody's having all this great sex. Uh, on Google, the number one complaint about a marriage and also a frequent complaint about a relationship is lack of sex, that it's sexless. There are three and a half times more Google searches for sexless marriage than for loveless marriage. Uh, there, are, there are three and a half times more Google searches for sexless marriage than for unhappy marriage. There are seven times more searches for sexless marriage than for loveless marriage. Uh, and the number one complaint that people type into Google about a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, or a girlfriend is that that partner won't have sex with me. That's way more common than won't talk to me or won't text me back. <laughs> and we already see in this data some things that are different than maybe conventional wisdom might tell us. Uh, there are actually twice as many complaints on Google that a boyfriend won't have sex with me than that a girlfriend won't have sex with me. And I think that points out maybe a difference between uh, what people might tell you in society and what actually happens there's a vision of men as wanting sex all the time and wanting sex three times a day and why won't and having you know high testosterone and uh, overwhelming sex drives and on Google if anything it's women more often complaining that their boyfriends don't want to have sex with them than men complaining that their girlfriends don't want to have sex with them 
Uh, so a, a different vision, I think a different window into uh, human sexuality on Google. So one thing, the first thing that we see in uh, Google searches is that there's a lack of sex. Why is there so little sex? I think one reason that is also apparent in internet data is overwhelming sexual insecurity. Uh, you didn't need me, a data expert, a, a sex expert, to tell you that... No, that's true. Based on the JCC, I'm a sex expert, so... Uh, you didn't need me to come and tell you that men have insecurity about the size of their genitals. Uh, that's probably well known in contemporary society that that could be an issue and a concern that men have. Uh, but I think it is staggering the degree to which men Google questions about their penis and how to make it bigger and whether it's small. Uh, the number one Googled body part by men is their penis. Uh, they Google more questions about their penis than about their lo lungs, lungs, liver, ears, nose, throat, and brain combined. For every 100 Google searches men ask about their penis, they ask five about their brain. Uh, <laughs> men ask, ask, more, ask Google more frequently how to make their penis bigger than how to tune a guitar, make an omelet, or change a tire. Uh, men's top questions about the side effects, top question about the side effects of steroids is not anything about the health effects, but whether it may make their penis smaller. And my favorite one is uh, questions about aging. There's a lot of anxiety on Google around the aging process, not surprisingly. And men have questions that, as they're getting older, is their IQ getting lower? Is their blood pressure getting higher? Is their metabolism getting slower? But all of them are paled in comparison to the number one question men have about the aging process, which, with, which is, is their penis getting smaller? So, uh, and then, this is not really necessarily related to insecurity, but just another fact, interesting factoid. One of the top questions about a penis on Google is how big is my penis? Which is, I think, the point of this is really just that people are weird, because it's not obviously clear how Google would give the answer to this <laughs> question, but uh, that is very frequently asked uh, by men. Uh, I call this not just sexual insecurity, but needless sexual insecurity. Uh, for every 170, so what, what, so we also actually, so one thing you see in Google is you get to see the questions of actual men about their penises and how big it is and how they make it bigger and concerns that it's small. We also get the questions of women searching about their husbands and their boyfriends. Uh, and women do on Google express a lot of concerns about their husbands, about his temper problems, about his potential uh, you know, whether, he, lo whether he, he loves her enough and they're arguing too much. And one thing women rarely search about, it turns out, is their partner's penis. Uh, for every 170 searches men make about their own penis, women make about one about a partner's penis. And when they do, about 40% of the complaints are that it's too big and it's causing pain, uh, which actually I showed this to my friend Mauricio, who I don't know is in the audience, who made me show him the actual data. He did not believe that that was a problem that women could complain that a penis was too big, but it is 100% in the data. Uh, that is true that, that uh, women do complain frequently that their partner's penis is too big, and men, uh, almost non-existent, are searches from men complaining that their penis is too big and how they might make it smaller. So uh, you get a very, very different view of what women want and what men want in their own uh, genitals on Google. Uh, needless sexual insecurity, men do not have a monopoly on needless sexual insecurity. Uh, women are obsessed with their bodies as well, but one of the things that to me was shocking, I did not even know this was an issue, is vaginal odors, is like a huge issue. And it's, it's actually not, like, not a joke. Some people said like, sex, like uh, sex educators contacted me later that they're going to incorporate this into sex ed because it's never actually talked about, but it is a huge issue that women are very, very concerned about what their vaginas smell like uh, and how to improve its odor. And I'll just read, this is actually a line from my New York Times column, which is probably my favorite line I've ever written in a New York Times column, so I'll read it out loud. 
women are most, con and this is based on the data, this is like 100% factual, I can defend all these. Women are most concerned their vaginas smell like fish, followed by vinegar, onions, ammonia, garlic, cheese, body odor, urine, bread, bleach, feces, sweat, metal, feet, garbage, and rotten meat. Uh, so that's vaginal odors for you. <laughs> and it's needless again, men do sometimes complain about a partner's vaginal odor, and what are they complaining about? Not about the rotten meat or the ammonia or the garlic or the cheese. <laughs> They're smelling condoms or another man's semen. In the, that, that's what they think they smell. So, and that's, of course, they think their partner is cheating on them. So you see this kind of over and over again in the data where men and women are kind of on two different planes, but they're all a plane of complete neurosis and insecurity, <laughs> just not on the same plane. So, uh, you know, you kind of have women, they're convinced their vagina smells like cheese, and the man's convinced it smells like, con like condoms, or they're not using condoms, who's, who's that condom, blah, blah, blah. And it's, yeah, so basically, we're all a mess. Uh, needless sexual insecurity, uh, woman, breast implants. There are 7 million Google searches into breast plants, implants every year. Only 300,000 breast plant implants every year, so about 23 Google searches for breast implants for every woman who goes through with it. Uh, it's needless, I claim, because men, when they Google about a partner's wife and getting breast implants, often they're like, why is she doing this? Is she cheating on me? Uh, does this mean she's trying to find a better man? that she can use these better breasts for. And actually, this, this is true. The top Google search about a girlfriend's breasts is, I love my girlfriend's boobs. And it's not clear, again, what they're trying to find from Google <laughs> when they make that search. <laughs> so I think these two facts you get from the Google searches is one, this, ma this lack of sex, which also you see in the condom sales, that there's a lot less, uh, huge complaints that people aren't having sex, they're in a sexless relationship, their, their boyfriend won't have sex, their girlfriend won't have sex, their husband won't have sex, their wife won't have sex. And then number two, you have this massive insecurity around people's bodies. And I think those two findings may be related. Uh, maybe if we worried less about sex, we'd have more of it, is one of my conclusions from uh, this data. I think that's the beginning of the types of things that we can learn from new internet data sources, a lot of new windows into human sexuality on questions where we've maybe been getting misleading information from surveys. Uh, so this other study I did is how many men are gay. And if you ask people in uh, the openly gay population, maybe surveys or also Facebook profiles where people say they're interested in men or interested in women, about 3% of men say they're openly gay, tell other people that they're gay. And another huge fact here, striking fact in the data, is there are huge differences in different parts of the country in the size of the openly gay population. In places that have high tolerance towards homosexuality, places where support for gay marriage is very, very high, there are many more openly gay men than in states where that are intolerant towards gays, where support for gay marriage is very low. So in California, where support for gay marriage is among the highest in the country, about 4.5% of men are openly gay. In Mississippi, where one, probably the most intolerant uh, state in the country, where support for gay marriage and rights for gays are very poor, only 1.5% of men uh, are openly gay. And there are two potential explanations for this, if you think about it. And both of them probably, ha you would think, would have some truth to that. The first is mobility. So gay men who are born in Mississippi or born in Alabama or born in Tennessee or born in Kentucky, born in places where it's hard to be gay, are going to move out to California or Massachusetts or New York. So there are legitimately going to be more gay men in these states just because people move there. And the second is maybe the closet is playing a role. That uh, men are, are that m maybe it's not true that only 1.5% of men in Mississippi are gay. Maybe they're not telling surveys this and not telling Facebook this. So the idea, and I, I, I want to like kind of just emphasize just how much new information there is in online data. 
we can actually answer a really difficult question like this or get some real clues into it. So the first place we can get clues is with Facebook data. Facebook actually, if you can think about your profile, they ask you your hometown and where you currently live. So they ask you where you came from and where you are now, and we can actually see how many gay men move out of intolerant parts of the country into tolerant parts of the country. And when you do that analysis, you see that there clearly is mobility. There most definitely are gay men who move out of Mississippi into California, and very, very few gay men born in California who move to Mississippi. So this is explaining some of the difference, but when you do the math, it can't explain nearly all of it. It can only explain a small percent of the difference. So this suggests that actually there are a similar number of gay men in different parts of the country. And the next way to test this, and again, I want you to emphasize just how remarkable this data is relative to what we've been using in the past. Like, we didn't used to have data like this. We can actually see the porn searches in different parts of the country and see how much gay porn is being searched in different parts of the country. And you see there is more gay porn in parts of the country where there's more tolerance towards homosexuality. There are more gay men in San Francisco than in, in Jackson, Mississippi, because gay men have moved there but the differences are much smaller than the, than the differences in the openly gay population. So in California, about 5.7% of porn searches are, are for gay porn. In Mississippi, about 4.7% of porn searches are for gay porn. So a difference about one percentage point instead of the three percentage point difference in the openly gay population. Does everyone kind of follow that, that there's a lot more similarity in the gay, in the gay, gay porn searches than there is in the openly gay population? So it doesn't seem like there really are only 1.5% of men in Mississippi are gay. Uh, it seems pretty clear that closer to 5% of, of men in Mississippi are gay and that they're just not admitting it. Uh, they're not openly gay. They're in the closet and to some degree. And the evidence gets stronger for this. Uh, the number one question, that Google question that starts, is my husband? is, is my husband gay? There are 10% more searches for, is my husband gay, than, is my husband cheating? And about eight times more searches for, is my husband gay, than, is my husband alcoholic, or is my husband depressed? Uh, which actually, if you do the data, I think, I want to show that, that, that there is a point to these searches, but I think women are too concerned about their husband's sexuality and not concerned enough about his mental state, because there actually are a lot more depressed people than gay people. But, uh, so women's priorities are a little off. But that said, if you uh, do the, if you, there probably is some signal in this that women have seen maybe a porn site on a computer or a certain email that makes them think that perhaps their husband is gay. So there's probably some information of this. And you look where are these searches concentrated. They're overwhelmingly concentrated in parts of the country with high intolerance, which I argued earlier, there are a lot of gay men in the closet. So they're really high in Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, in 21 of the 25 states where the question, is my husband gay, is most frequently asked, support for gay marriage is below the national average. So I think this really adds another piece of evidence that there are a lot of gay men in intolerant parts of the country that remain in the closet. There are other ways to, to kind of get more uh, information on this, and again, I just want to emphasize just how much information there now is online in digital data that we just never had before. So I scraped Craigslist uh, there. On Craigslist, there are casual encounters where you can meet, men can meet other men online, kind of anonymous sex, uh, and these are higher in intolerant parts of the country in Mississippi and Alabama. There are more casual encounters, which you might think is more likely if you're in closeted and you're not really looking for an open relationship. Uh, there are some other interesting things in the data. The number one Google search after gay porn is free gay porn by people who, like, that kind of makes sense. But the number one search after free, besides free gay porn after gay porn is gay test. And that's really common in Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee. And you can kind of try to think of the mindset of a man that searches gay porn and immediately afterwards, or five minutes afterwards, searches gay test. And you can kind of think that Maybe they're a tortured soul in some degree, because it's pretty, I think, uh, you know, probably sad, sad search that you're trying to figure out if you're gay or probably trying to convince yourself that you're not gay after, after doing that, uh, after the gay porn. 
So when you put together all the math, I argue about 5% of men are gay, about 30% of gay men in the United States are still in the closet, deep in the closet, and about 75% of gay men in Mississippi are still in the closet. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of progress on gay rights and stuff, but it's still, uh, there's still kind of a long way to go, I think. All right, so that's uh, the Google searches on uh, homosexuality. That's another study. So then I started, now I'm writing a book, which is coming out in February, and I hope everybody here will buy it. And I'm still trying to think of a title, so if anyone can think of a title, please contact me afterwards. I'm tr I wanted to call it How Big Is My Penis? What Google Searches Reveal About Human Nature. My <laughs> publisher won't let me, so. Uh, but... And they say, like, you can't, it can't be in an airport if it's called How Big Is My Penis. Like, you can't sell it in airports, and that's where most of the books sell now, so. But I'm writing this book, so I'm doing more research on a lot of topics around what Google searches can teach us about all kinds of behaviors, and also what, it's not just Google searches. There's a lot of new internet information. Uh, so I've been working with a porn company, Pornhub, and they've been giving me their data. And uh, I really, so when I was practicing this talk, I was telling my friends to try to say, make me sound less creepy, because it is a little creepy to like research porn all day. Uh, but then Jordan told me that of the, this entire series, I'm the least creepy person, so. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm not worried anymore, but. Uh, uh, anyway, so yeah, so I spend my days researching all this data, is, by the way, is anonymous and aggregate. Uh, so researching porn searches uh, that I got from Pornhub, which is very, very interesting, and you can learn a lot about human behavior. You have to be a little bit more careful here. So the evidence is that like, pretty much every man now is watching porn, watches porn, but only about 20% of women do. So it's a little bit, you can't maybe learn as much about women because it's only a selected sample of women who watch porn, which is a little bit smaller. Uh, but one of the first things I did with this data was to compare what men and women look for in porn. Uh, so that what searches tilt towards men and what searches tilt towards, fem towards women. And it really is amazing. There are like two different brains, like the male and female brain when it comes to sex. Very, very clearly. Men are much more visual. Uh, so the searches that are male are almost all about something of the appearance of a woman. Women are much more about the stories or the emotions behind the act. Uh, very rarely about the appearance of the people in the act. So like almost very, very different. But another thing that's striking is even within these searches, there is huge variation in what men and women look for. So like there really are, is a taste for everything. Men will sometimes look for a tan woman or a tan man and also look for a pale woman or a pale man. They'll look for tall and short. They'll look for skinny. They'll look for overweight. Like something like 5% of male searches are for like obese women uh, on porn sites. So there really is like a lot of very, very huge variation in men's taste. Uh, but it's all focused, almost all focused on the appearance in some way. Uh, and women, they're also in porn searches is huge variation, uh, but also like to the point there's op people are searching, women are searching for the opposite, different women search for the opposite thing, but all focused on the act, like some, something about the story behind the act. So they look for romantic and passionate, but also very aggressive or even violent porn. Uh, the number one most shocking thing I found in porn searches, which is a little politically incorrect, so I probably shouldn't say, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is that 19% of, uh, female searches on porn sites are for gangbangs, which is like a group of men uh, having sex with one woman. Uh, and really politically incorrect but also is that rape porn is way more common among women than men. It's actually kind of surprisingly common among women. So violence and rape and stuff like that. Uh, again, when you look at porn data, the, there's, you notice a pretty huge difference between maybe what people wish their desires were and what their actual desires are. And obviously I'm not saying that that makes any of this stuff okay, but 
it's just in, in people's brains, particularly when they're online and by themselves, people have really weird, people are really, really weird. Uh, <laughs> the basic lesson of porn is however th weird you thought people are, they're a lot weirder. Uh, and yeah, so that's male versus female desires. How old women look in porn videos watched by men. Uh, so one thing you can do, and I did, is I built a little script that tells you there's, now you can do it with machine learning, say how old a face looks. <coughs> so what you can do is look through, is you can build a script and like take a face in a porn video and say how old does that face look? Uh, does it look 50, 60, 20, 30, 10, whatever? Uh, so I did that for basically a random sample of porn videos watched by men to see the age of women in male videos. And it's a pretty interesting uh, graph, kind of like evolutionarily, you kind of see the fertile years or the big uh, peak uh, that men tend to watch women porn in their young 20s. Uh, and it drops off pretty dramatically in their, above their 30s. You can also break down the age of women in porn by the age of men who are watching the porn. And there's basically no change so as men get older, they're still watching 22-year-old women in porn. Like, basically doesn't change at all as, as men age, uh, which is pretty interesting. A couple other things you see about the age of women in porn is that, well, Nabokov was basically onto something. There is like a huge interest in underage girls. Uh, so this is just based on like legal porn. So a lot of women, this basically just looks at the faces and some of the faces look very, very young, which is kind of intentional and to appeal to men who have taste for young girls. Also about 10% of male porn searches are for underage girls. So there's kind of a huge demand for young girls, which isn't really talked about except by Nabokov, but uh, seems to be perhaps a surprisingly and disturbingly large uh, popularity. And then there is, there are like just, there's pretty much a fringe and weirdness at every point. There are, there are lots of, there are like 1% of searches are for granny porn or mature porn, even by young men, uh, which surprised me as well. So uh, that's the age of women in porn. I think another big theme of porn that comes out over and over again is that, so like the main theme of porn data is that People are really, really weird, which I, I guess I said earlier, but it really is true. And one of the weirdnesses you see is the amount of men who seem stuck in childhood in some way, uh, which is like comes across basically in many, many different ways. Uh, also, the Google searches when you talk about well, ex when women talk about husbands' fetishes, a couple that they report among the top are their husband wants to wear a diaper and wants to be breastfed, which is childish, right? Uh, and you kind of see these things happen over and over again, where men in some degree are stuck in childhood. Uh, so, uh, the, the, so this kind of shows that this is all Google searches about uh, various cartoons. And basically porn has captured the cartoon market to some degree, uh, where a common search for Scooby-Doo now is Scooby-Doo porn. And I think it's, it is not a coincidence because it comes up over and over again that men to some degree get stuck in childhood. I think this is not just like a random quirk of cartoons. I, uh, I think that seems to happen a lot. And I think it also comes up if you take the occupations uh, of women in porn watched by men, the number one occupation is babysitter porn, which I think if, if it wasn't for the cartoons and the diapers and the breastfeeding, I'd say that was just a coincidence. But I think when you put all the information together, I think you start to see kind of an idea that men, that lots of men may be in their sexual, in their sexual quirks or fetishes stuck in childhood in various degrees. Uh, so looking for babysitters or teachers. Uh, and, you know, and this happens, this is breaking down the occupation, the top occupations in porn watched by men uh, by different age groups, and babysitter is the top one for every age group, so it doesn't seem to stop as you get older. Uh, and that's true of cartoon characters and lots of other things. So I think there is a, definitely 
there is some weirdness going on around men and childhood in sexual desires, perhaps larger than we previously realized. The age of men in porn, I did the same thing for women. Uh, I think a couple things stand out. It's women are much less likely to have very, very young or very, very old preferences. It's much less st like humped on the 20 to 30 year old group. It's more 20 to 40 year olds. But that said, women still are predominantly into younger men, like visually, like 22 year old men are, hot, are hotter to women than 40-year-old men or 33-year-old men. I didn't know that was true and hope that wasn't true, but <laughs> <laughs> the data told me that, no, really, uh, like, like, I think uh, perhaps in the dating market, women are more likely to overlook this desire, but the women still think, just as men do, that younger people are a lot hotter than older people, so uh, that's kind of, I think, a little different than some people s say or think. Ancestral desires, all right. So uh, I told you that people are really weird, right? I warned you about that. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, like a lot of people, kind of Freud is kind of passe these days, right? Everyone just thinks he was kind of a creepy weirdo uh, and was pretty much wrong about everything. But I think when you start looking at porn data, you kind of start thinking that Freud was onto maybe more than we thought uh, because or porn or search data, because there definitely is a lot of the issues that he talked about that people don't really talk about do uh, come up a lot. So the number one ser Google search about I want to have sex with is I want to, you know, like Freud couldn't have written, couldn't have guessed this, would have guessed this perfectly, right? I want to have sex with my mom is like the number one search. And part of that is presumably because you don't, like you know it's a weird desire, right? You Google something because you know it's weird. You're not going to Google I want to have sex with uh, my boyfriend or my girlfriend, because that's presumably normal, you are going to Google a weird sexual desire. But it's still like much higher than I want to have sex with my boss or my student or a lot of, or my secretary or a lot of things that might warrant a Google search that, that, uh, that don't come up as high as these ancestral desires. Uh, and it's also like a really common theme on porn now is incest porn. Uh, like, and kind of exactly in the way that Freud predicted, where men watch a lot of incestual porn about uh, moms and sons, and women watch a lot of incestual porn about uh, dads and daughters, so like exactly as Freud predicted, like he couldn't have predicted better, so I don't know. I think Freud, like everyone thinks Freud was wrong in psychology now, but I think in the, in the data, there's maybe more evidence for some of the stuff he was talking about than people might have imagined, and definitely worthy of a lot of research. I think the next Freud will be a data scientist, will be looking through all this data and kind of learning a lot more about the quirks and weirdnesses and, uh, that people have that maybe we haven't known for a while. So uh, that is the end of my talk. I guess there are like, I meant to put a conclusion slide, but I forgot. And <laughs> So I'll just talk about the summation, the conclusions, the things I want you to take away from this. I think there are four main takeaways that I, that I, I kind of learn in this new data about se human sexuality from these computer and internet data. The first is that uh, there's a lot less sex than people say they're, say they're having, and like lack of sex is a huge complaint uh, in the world. Uh, that was with the Google searches on sexless marriages and also the condom sales and sexless relationships and boyfriends who don't want sex. So like a lot of lack of sex happening. That's number one. Number two is that uh, there's a lot of massive insecurity uh, about people's bodies, like to a degree that, again, everyone knew that, but to a degree that maybe we didn't imagine and some focuses that we didn't know about previously. Uh, Number three is the study of the gay population. Where we're able to see very, very clearly that it's not true that there are so few gay men in states like Mississippi and Tennessee. And we see that the closet remains a huge issue in many parts of the United States today. And number four is with this new porn data that people are really, really weird uh, and that we're able to see in very, very different ways uh, how they are. And I, like, there's been a lot more research that I've done. These are kind of the things I want to emphasize in this talk. 
uh, but I think I'm now going to open it up to questions about either the stuff I found now or maybe questions you might have on other things I found. So Jordan has a microphone and she's going to pass there, it around. There are mac microphones on either side of the aisle. First question is on your left. Yeah, quick question. How do you get your data? From Google or do you? No, so uh, this data is actually public. It's just a lot of people don't realize it. And you have to like, yeah, there are ways to get better data but that I've been doing for a while that I talk about on my website, but you can see the data. And again, like one thing to emphasize, of course, is all anonymous and aggregate. So it's not like anybody's looking through a particular search. This just puts together all the searches in Mississippi or Alabama or Tennessee. Uh, but it's Google Trends is the main product, and there's also Google AdWords. The next question is right over here. I'd be interested to know if you did any research worldwide, like what would this research look like on the uh, equivalent of the Google of China, or perhaps Google in South America somewhere? Uh, how do, uh, France, I'm just curious of how the people would come back with all of their statistics and how it would relate to the United States? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, I have started to look about that. I, I have started to look at that a little bit. Uh, China uses Baidu, which is a little bit hard to get the data, but uh, like the preliminary stuff I'm finding is that things are actually very, very similar around the world. That if you do, you know, the, the, that for example, something like men being into images and women being into uh, more stories or emotions seems to be universal, which maybe it, because it's biological. Uh, but I think there's definitely more to be done on that. And uh, probably, probably if you buy my book, there's probably going to be a lot more on that. So The next uh, question is down yeah. in front. Thanks. Uh, thanks. This is a two-part question. The first is, did you control your data for unique users rather than just aggregate query? Because insecure people might search a lot more about the size of their penis. Um, and then the second question is, uh, Given that the vast majority of women in porn are in their 18s to 24s, um, would it be better to control the graph for the age of the women in porn so that you can actually see the relative ratio of, of people who watch it? Thanks. Great question. So the first one is no, like that just information is not, the, the information that Google gives does not control for individual person. So we don't know. Uh, it, you know, I think that probably when we're talking about millions of searches, it's not one person searching a million times. And if it is, if it's like a bot, they'll kind of take that away. Uh, so it probably is more universal, but it's definitely biased towards people who make more searches. Uh, and I also did do the, the porn analysis by actual female age. Uh, it's very similar, but of course you don't have the under 18 because they're illegal. So that, one of the reasons I want to do the actual machine learning is because you can see like what people look like versus what their age is, which may be more relevant for male preferences. Uh, but it's also similarly very, very young. The next question is right over here. Um, I, I have a question about how you get your demographic data. Like, how do you correlate the searches with the demographics, gender, or I don't know, do you have age or? Yeah, so the, the porn data is based on Google Analytics, so it's probably not perfect. Uh, nobody knows for sure how old, you, how old you are. Like, on the internet, you might be a dog. Uh, but. It's, you can kind of see the guess they make about you, and usually it's reasonably accurate and probably isn't biased in some systematic way, but uh, yeah, it's a guess. Because you log into Google or because you log into other sites you visited? Yeah, based on other sites you visited, yeah. The next question is in the middle. So I'm curious if there's any interesting trends around engagement. So how long people spend on a topic, how deep they go into page rank. Um, is it just literally number of queries, or do you get interesting data when you start to look at how often they're spending searching on a particular topic? Yeah, uh, I don't have that data. The Google Trends or Google AdWords doesn't make that data available, but I'm sure there are interesting things on that. But yeah, there are lots of things you could do if you had better data. But as Rumsfeld said, you go to war with the army you got, not the army you want, right? <laughs> the next question is right over here. So just as the um, 19th century information about sexual perversions, as they tended to call it then, um, was focused on people who were aggregated in places like mental institutions and seeing shrinks, 
how do you explain or, or sort of enter the question of how representative this stuff is that you're seeing in the searches of um, aggregate people? I mean, obviously, if there are only so many condoms being sold and we're overstating that by a factor of three or four, that's an easy question to answer. But when you go into the, like the porn preferences and stuff, do you have a way of thinking about that to, to pull out the, like the super fetishists or the, one who, the ones who really want to spend all their time in this mental space of searching and thinking and fantasizing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think one of the advantages of this data is relative, as you said, because people are so hesitant to talk about sex, We've kind of, the main approach to learn is something like the Kinsey survey, which is of prisoners, predominantly in prostitutes, which probably isn't a representative sample, but a very honest and open sample. So you get things like 10% of men are gay, which I think the data shows definitely 10% of men are not gay. Uh, it is more than the surveys tell you, but it's more about 5%. Uh, so I think one of the advantages of this Google searches and some of the porn data is you do get a more representative sample than uh, some of these cherry pick samples they've been using in the past. Uh, I think for Google searches and for Facebook, they're so universal that they are, almost, they are pretty close to representative and will be in the future. Uh, some old people don't use it, but once I think like, they pass on, there will be a more representative sample. And I think like porn, I think it's a huge issue with women, which is why I kind of put those, ca those big caveats, because porn is le much less popular among women than men, so it's a little bit harder to say, okay, if 18% of female searches on porn are for gangbangs, does that mean that 18% of women are into gangbangs? Probably not, because the women who are watching porn are different from the average woman, but it certainly suggests it's a not trivial fantasy. If 20% of women watch porn and 18% of their searches are for gangbangs, that's like, already telling us that that's a bigger fantasy than we, than we previously util, utilized. And you kind of can maybe benchmark it, well, what if they're not at all representative? And what if they're slightly representative? You can kind of see the differences. So I think uh, the basic point is you don't want to take out of this, like, OK, exactly 18% of female sexual desire is on gangbangs or, or anything like that. But you definitely do get a window into things that we haven't seen previously that you can get kind of an idea of things that might be more important than we previously saw or less important than we previously thought. And I do think the Google searches, like it's not just prisoners and prostitutes, it's pretty much everybody making Google searches. So it, it definitely is uh, a more representative sample than we've ever previously had. And, and the porn with men, not, since so many men watch porn, is pretty representative uh, there. But I think you definitely do have issues with, you know, if men are watching, if some men are watching porn all day and they're just keep on making searches. Uh, yeah, I can't deal with the data right now. Can't deal with that. Maybe in the future we'll be able to. Uh, this stuff's kind of still early, and we're uh, in its development. Uh, so, but uh, I'm kind of showing what what, I, what what we have so far. The next question is up here on your left. Uh, yes, I have two questions. One is this: I, I assume does not capture um, Siri queries at all. Is that a technological possibility? And the second question is, do you plan to um, study also uh, gay women as well as gay men? Yeah, so uh, uh, Siri, yeah, not yet. Maybe they'll have the infrastructure in place uh, in the future. Gay women, initially I, I didn't for a couple reasons. Uh, first is because Women watch porn so infrequently, uh, it's a little bit less to get, it's a little bit less easy to get a representative sample uh, of the lesbian population than the gay population in the porn searches. And the second thing is the Facebook data on women. I think a lot of women, it's, from what I did, the percent of women who are interested in women on Facebook is like 10%. And I think a lot of them are like friends who are joking around with their friends and stuff, like saying they're into each other and it's not clear that it's, because it's maybe less loaded than a gay man, so people kind of don't take it as seriously and you get a different viewpoint. But, uh, so it was a little bit hard, for those two reasons, it was a little bit harder to do that study for women and I kind of passed on it initially. I think one of the things that's interesting that actually a lot of people have started to find using porn data is the percent of straight women that, the women that define themselves as straight 
that exclusively seek relationships with men and would call themselves straight who watch lesbian porn predominantly is like very, very high, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think a very interesting that I think female sexuality is less maybe connected. The porn a woman watches may be less closely connected to how she defines herself than men would. Uh, so that's kind of one of the early findings in some of these new data sources. Uh, but uh, there's, on all these topics, there's so much more to be done uh, and so much more to be learned. The next question's right here. Hi, I'm wondering how all this research and all this data has affected you and your life and your outlook on people. You keep saying they're weird, but how does that affect how you interact with your friends and your dating? And <laughs> like, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I mean... To me, I've always had a very dark and weird view of humanity, so there's a lot of I told you so now, because now I... <laughs> this has kind of just confirmed everything I've always suspected secretly, but... Uh, so yeah, basically I just say I told you so, like, and I, like my friends have literally always said, you're paranoid, Seth, like you think everybody's like, has these weird thoughts, and now I'm like, nope, now the data backs me up 100%. Uh, so it really hasn't... I've always viewed life this way since I've been basically a little, like since I've been three years old, I've been accusing everybody of hiding deep secrets. Uh, and yeah, now I'm just, I just point more to the data. So no real change in my outlook. The next question is here in the middle. Actually, my question kind of dovetails onto the one previous to this last one. Um, when you were in the section talking about uh, um, gay men and doing the search on gay male and porn or gay porn, I was wondering if it was controlled for just men respondents, and I was wondering if women um, searching for gay porn could have shown up in that search as well. Yeah, so I was able to, I was able to control, but using the same kind of weak control of, of, of based on people, pe what pe websites people go to, but uh, you are right that a woman do watch gay porn. That is a common, uh, one of the more common searches uh, and views of women uh, on porn is gay, is, is gay porn. But the numbers that we're showing should, are estimates of the male population, but maybe a little bit off because it's not perfect, so. Uh, but yeah. Right here is the next one. Yeah, I was just curious for the first part of your slide, if you think there's any correlation between the lack of sex and then the insecurities, if what people typically search after they search like lack of sex, what their next search is, kind of akin to what you mentioned with like, um, is my husband gay? And then, or like the gay test, like shortly thereafter, sequentially, if there's a sequence that you find that people typically do in, in the research you've done. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't look at that. Uh, I guess it, in some sense, if that theory is right, it wouldn't be, if a woman's work, searching my husband won't have sex, with, if, my, if a woman's searching my boyfriend won't have sex with me, you'd want to see the boyfriend searches maybe, right? And he'd search that his penis is too small or whatever, but uh, yeah you would have like maybe in the back of your mind like a particular reason right like when you search on webmd you search your symptoms and then you think like oh my gosh what if it's this right so you have your own kind of mental leap that you're taking on your own i'm just curious if the data was something something similar no I, I didn't it's a good it's a it's a good idea i didn't i didn't look at it i think uh you know it might be that i i said that i think that women for all their concerns about like i think there is some information in their searches that their husband's gay but they probably maybe overdo it with the is my husband gay searches, that might be related also to the lack of sex, where maybe there are other reasons that a husband isn't interested in having sex and women maybe immediately assume that he's gay. Uh, that could be related as well, I don't know. It's, it's, a lot of, it's definitely an interesting area. I, don't, I, I hadn't done that, but it's definitely something somebody should do. Or uh, Yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. The next question is on your left. Hi, my question, so a lot of this data kind of points back to items that, you know, they're very sensitive and very personal. You made a comment earlier about how, you know, one teacher said she was going to start incorporating this information on Google searches into her classroom. I'm wondering if you're going to do anything to elevate kind of the platform for this data on a bigger scale, you know, aside from your book, to kind of make this information public knowledge. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of why I've been writing these New York Times columns instead of academic papers, because so, I kind of have been like, I do want people to know about this stuff, uh, because I do think it is, it is important, and you are getting into parts of the psyche that, are, that we don't usually talk about. You know, I did another one on, 
uh, you know, depression and lack of therapy usage in some parts of the country. A, a lot of men in the South ha suffer from depression but don't see therapists. Where, and you can see that very clearly in this data. So it might be good for men to know that they're not alone in that, in that suffering and a lot of these sexual stuff. But yeah, I'm trying to like, I definitely am trying to get this out in the public arena. Uh, doctors have also uh, contacted me that they're gonna talk more about, like when they're talking to their patients, uh, bring up some issues. Like even though it's a random thing, the why, why does my husband, my husband wants me to breastfeed him, which is like 10 times more popular in India than any other. Th this actually is an interesting one with the differences in countries. My husband wants me to breastfeed me is like 10 times more popular in India than, than ever, any other country. And I have no idea why and can't figure out why. But some people in Indian doctors are now gonna like, they're like, they had no idea, but they're gonna start talking to their patients. Like you might get this desire when a woman has a kid to be breastfed. Uh, and like, that's not something that they didn't voluntarily bring up, but kind of talking about how that's something that it seems like from this search data, a lot of people have. So I think that use case is potentially very powerful where there are things that insecurities or desires that people have thought are very, very, that they're, they would assume they're alone in that. And now maybe they can learn they're not alone. I think, you know, it's not just, it's, and, and you know, part of it is the research, but I think also just the web helps because like I, I kind of made light of like the vaginal odors thing, but it actually it's a serious issue. And when you see the searches that come up, it's a lot of like the message boards, it's a lot of young like teenage girls and they're really panicked like that their life is over, that this is like a huge issue in their life. Like, and it's something that nobody talks about or nobody would ever have talked about. And now they get to see the internet and they get people to tell them and they see that, oh no, they're not the only person in the world who's ever been concerned about this. Uh, and that is, I think, a very powerful thing that we haven't previously had that I think a lot of people's like weird insecurities or what, that, that, when, when people think their life is over because they have such some insecurity about something, they can learn on the internet that, it, that it's not. So I think that, that helps. But I think also, yeah, I am hoping that, you know, through some of this popular writing, that doctors or se sex educators uh, will kind of incorporate some of this to, to maybe bring up concerns that they didn't know were big deals before, but are uh, big deals. So, yeah. Thank you. I think, do we have any other? Oh, oh. Uh, we have one last question all the way at the top. I will go get it. <laughs> Afterwards, I welcome everyone to join us for a reception in the atrium. Seth will be there. Do you want to just step into the aisle? Maybe meet me halfway. You can. Thanks. Last question. Cool. Um, so okay. So going back to one of the earlier slides, which said, uh, you know, my my boyfriend won't have sex with me. My girlfriend won't have sex with me. So is your research based on that exact phrase? Won't have sex with me, or is that a header for fifty other permutations of the same phrase under it? Are you just referring to when when you say things on the slides? Are they saying things that are the exact words that you're using and it's only in reference to that specific query or is it a conglomerate of a thousand other variations? I think what I, that's a great question. What I try to do generally is usually in these things there's not, there's like one or two, one query that's way more common than any other query. Uh, but I basically test just every other query and usually if they change the results then I won't include it. So that particular one is just based on that search but if you include all the different searches, which are much less frequently searched, it would be roughly the same two to one ratio. And like, is my husband gay? I was just talking about the exact search, is my husband gay? But if you count, include signs my husband is gay versus signs my husband is depressed or sign or uh, how do I know if my husband's gay? Things that are searched a lot less frequently, it's pretty much very similar ratios. Uh, so sometimes, rarely you do have a difference where there's something more popular will be different. It, it'll, the answer will change if you include a lot of different searches, uh, but in these cases, they're very, very similar. Uh, but it is like kind of one of the issues you definitely do have to consider with this. And uh, you know, it's kind of another issue is that a lot of people are critical of this data for that point. They're like, language makes such a big issue and, and uh, you know, this data is useless for that point. But one thing I remind them is that surveys, language makes a huge difference as well, right? If you say, do you think uh, African-Americans should get preferential treatment uh, in jobs, you're gonna get a very, very different answer than if you ask, do you think based on historical su suffering, 
like we should even the playing field for African Americans. So you get totally different survey answers on those questions, the percent who say that. So there's always been issues with language in research, uh, and they're not fully developed in this new area of research. Uh, but uh, basically, I try to just yeah include all the different searches if I can. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Seth.